And the majority of individuals that were present for that meeting shared with us, no, we understand that South carries less enrollment on average than North does, build what you need. So there you're gonna see it reflected in the footprints that we look at tonight, a slight square footage difference between the North Elementary and the South Elementary building. Okay. In addition to that, we went back and revisited and, and discussed secondary school programming and what we wanted that to look like. And then in addition to that, really looked at our athletic programs with our growing enrollment and what we needed to adequately um, add on and expand there, which we'll talk about more tonight. As we got into phase two, July and August, this is where the board made their final decision about moving forward with a three-site facility plan. We also developed materials for the review and comment that was sent to the Minnesota Department of Education and started to craft the information that's in the informational brochures that are present tonight and were sent out to district stakeholders. The review and comment was submitted in August and we prepared for the informational meetings like the one you're attending tonight. The board resolution was placed with a unanimous vote of 7-0 to put three ballot questions on the ballot this year. The phase that we're in right now is what we call the pre-referendum informational phase as we moved into September and October. This is our fifth of five community meetings we previously visited Hoffman, Elbow Lake, Kensington, and Bundle. A couple of things that I'll share with you and we will revisit this slide as we get to the end of the presentation tonight. There were a couple of things that intentionally came from discussions that the board had. One of those was that there are three separate ballot questions on the ballot that address three separate uh, needs within our district. We understand that different people are passionate about different things. Some people desire to vote yes to all three things that are on the ballot, and some people have individual preference about the things they'd like to see the district spend money on. The questions are not contingent upon each other, they're not related to each other, they are three separate questions that ask for three separate opinions from our public. In addition to that, one of the things we did that was very intentional this year was opt to do mail-in ballots. When I first joined on the board seven years ago, we were coming out of a time period where there, similar to this year, was a special election. There wasn't a, a governor election race, there wasn't a presidential election race. It was a special election for the school. And at that time, they opted to have individuals come to the Barrett location as a designated polling place. Many individuals expressed frustration that they had to travel in order to vote. And also, as we looked at last year with COVID, which is still very much among us, and wanting to allow every single person within our district to have a voice, we opted to do mail-in ballots, particularly for those that may not feel safe going out in the public and voting in a public polling place. So I'm going to move things over to uh, Tony Wolf from Zero Architects. He's going to talk a little bit about the vision that he gleaned from the board. No? Brian Bird, who wants to take it? <laughs> All right, thank you, Michelle. So, uh, as, as the board was talking about, uh oh, investing in existing buildings um, as you are at the North Campus and uh, at the North uh, Elementary and at the, uh, the Barrett site here. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're updating um, systems and infrastructure, but as you're building uh, new places like you are at, at South at, uh, at uh, Hoffman, that is going to be discussed in a little bit here, um, you know, we want to make sure that your building systems and your infrastructure are sustainable going forward for many years. And so that's one of the major goals of this project is to update older systems in buildings that are going to be continued to, uh, to be in use and to provide new systems that are going to be sustainable going forward uh, with your uh, with your new new construction uh, enhancements to to building uh, 
existing buildings providing better security. Security is an issue that we talk about all the time in school construction and school design. We want to make sure that our kids are, are safe when they're coming to school and providing a better, uh, a, a better control point for access into the building that can be monitored and can be, uh, uh, can be uh, a focal point for people that are coming into the school so that, that they can be credentialed, they can be provided with a badge so as they're going throughout the school people know that, they, uh, that they're uh, uh, there with a purpose and that they, uh, they've been screened before they come into the building. The way, that we, the way that we teach and the way that we learn is constantly evolving and the things that we're doing today are very different from things that were being done when a lot of the buildings, uh, particularly portions of the elementary schools, uh, were, were constructed for your district. And so providing space for collaboration, for group learning, for active learning, uh, those are all things that are really important in today's uh, educational environment. And really providing flexible space that allows teachers to adapt the way that they're teaching to the curriculum needs and to the students' needs, because every student learns a little bit differently, and we want to be able to adapt and, and, and uh, provide space that's sufficient and adequate for that. Uh, as you, as, as we walk through the existing elementary schools here, especially down in, in Kensington, one of the major issues down there is that there just isn't space for um, this one-on-one -on -one and small group instruction. Um, so when a parent is working with a student, you'll often see that happening out in the hallways. And so we want to make sure that we're providing space that's appropriate for that so that those students don't feel like they're set apart um, and, and they have spaces where they can have that the individual instruction that's necessary. And then you'll notice in, in the, two, uh, the second and the third question that, are, that will be discussed here today, um, expanding and improving uh, co-curricular activities for students, um, especially uh, you know, on, on this site here, so that students have access to outdoor athletic facilities or to um, to to uh, vocational programming, um, and, and we'll be talking about those as, as we move forward here. So um, these are our four kind of broad focus areas of the project, but they're all important. And uh, and I think the as as Michelle mentioned here, when uh, when we brought in the community members here after the failed referendum previously, and asked people to to provide input and to say you know what are the what are the things that are important to you as a district. Uh, there, there really was a lot of work done by the board and by staff here to make sure that these projects were right-sized, uh, that they, they were responsive to needs, but not overreaching. And, and I think that that that's, was a, a very important exercise to go through here. And, um, and, and uh, we, the result of that is programs at both the North and South Elementaries that are, that are appropriately sized for the programmatic needs um, of, the, of the staff and the students that are, are in those facilities. So um, we're excited about the plans. Um, Tony is going to talk specifically about the, the configuration of the plans, but before, uh, before he does that, we're going to talk just a little bit about the, uh, about the decision to put the South Elementary School in Hoffman. So I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle. So with the board's desire to leave no stone unturned and really revisiting all of the options that we had previously considered, or the boards before us had previously considered, one of the discussions that we had was, um, and as a result of looking at what we needed for adequate space to offer uh, consistent programming throughout our district, looking at South Elementary only being 35,000 square feet, and the desire to have a 58,000 square foot program to accommodate those one-on-one -on -one spaces like we were talking about, um, we started to look at where should the building be located, um, which was another extensive discussion that we had. Um, one of the things that we looked at was population, really wanting to place school, the school within um, the most populous, concentric part of our district. So as we started to look at numbers, and these are actual enrollment numbers, K through four, um, and thanks to Zerberg Architects for helping us kind of visualize this by pl plotting the maps here. Um, you'll notice that within one mile of Kensington, we have 19 students, within seven miles, 129, and within 10 miles, 145. When we started looking at Hoffman occupancy, within one mile, we had 72 students. And so again, kind of uh, as we go back to the listening sessions and some of the things we gleaned from that, knowing that parents do appreciate the opportunity when given such to walk their students to school, we also started to think about maybe what efficiencies there would be in relocating the building. 
So, um, you know, as I've mentioned at previous meetings, out of 72 students, even if a third or half of those students walk, that's a third or half of students that are not riding the bus. And so we might potentially have some efficiencies there too. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Tony, if I'm saying this right, to talk a little bit about the actual building spaces. So we'll just uh, run through the uh, building plans and the per, basically per question and how the, uh, the buildings and sites will be affected for, the, uh, for each question. So question about, about question number one, um, at North Elementary School there's about 40,000 square feet uh, that will be renovated of existing building and that's the gym from the surrounding spaces there. Um, that represents about 60% of the overall um, 65 thousand square foot building, and then there's a, a new addition of about 25,000 uh, square feet. And that uh, the south building as mentioned before is about 58,000 square feet. Um, so on uh, question number one, uh, these are kind of the goals that uh, we we feel like we met um, based on Brian's uh, uh, discussion a little bit earlier. Uh, we, we're providing flexible learning spaces for collaboration. Um, updating uh, some spaces for current curriculum techniques uh, with steam rooms and um, uh, those sorts of spaces. Uh, uh, we're lo essentially locating the instructional support and we're improving the uh, security of the building uh, by providing a central location for entry that's uh, right off of the admin suite and uh, has a bus traffic and um, vehicular traffic separated. Uh, so that the North Elementary School, uh, which you see in blue, is the additions, and the other color is the existing building. Uh, so around the main gymnasium, um, on the northeast side, or sorry, northwest side, uh, top left corner, uh, there's some large classrooms. Those are your existing pre-K and kindergarten classrooms. Those are going to stay. We're going to update um, finishes, update the systems in there, and bring everything up to kind of a current feel so that the whole building flows nicely. Um, Wrapping around the south side, we have some Head Start rooms and um, child care spaces in blue. There's a little new addition down there. Building mechanical services are staying kind of located on the south side. Uh, and then the main entrance, um, vestibule and uh, the main vestibule and admin space is located in that um, quadrant. So uh, basically, again, they'll come in, the admin space will be uh, directly adjacent um, to a secure vestibule. And um, there'll be a lot of windows and glass, glass along this side where the offices face over to provide some passive and active um, observation of, of people coming and going. So people always get the feeling that somebody could be watching them because there's people that sit in those offices. Um, so just again, providing some additional security um, for the building. Once you're directly inside, there's a, a common space that's kind of your pre-functional space for your gym as well as your cafeteria. So kind of do it focusing um, for those, those two items. Uh, and then, on the east side of the building are the two academic wings. Um, we've located two slots for uh, playgrounds, pre-K playground down towards the south side, that's um, near the pre-K rooms, and then the existing playground a little further to the north uh, for the older kids. Um, one thing to note as well, on the east side, there is space for a few more classrooms. Um, should there be need ever arise there, we can add on a few more classrooms um, if you're normal. Uh, continues to do well. Uh, these are just some images of what this building could potentially look like. Uh, if you look at the upper left photo, the darker roof uh, is the existing building with the lighter roof uh, roofs as the um, additions. And if you look down at the larger image to the right, uh, again, those are the offices along the main entrance there that provide that kind of passive and active. Um, Observation, you have the main entry vestibule that's here, and towards the bottom left, um, that's just looking back towards those offices and some um, blazing for some natural light into that uh, common space. At the South Elementary School, it's a very similar configuration with the admin and best, uh, secure vestibule directly adjacent to the commons um, the cafeteria area, um, with the gymnasium directly off of that. Uh, along the east side of the building. Again, we have uh, your academic wings with space to add on in the future if uh, the need ever arises. With a lot of those uh, support spaces centrally located, um, such as the media center, music rooms, special education, um, those sorts of uh, um, spaces. 
And again, our bus traffic, and pair, uh, this is the pair drop off and visitor parking, and the bus traffic are completely separated for improved safety. Again, just some views of what this potentially could look like. Uh, you've got your main entry with the uh, office admin area off to the left. Um, on the upper left image, again, some glazing, bring some natural daylight into the common space. Uh, and then just an overall view of the site, what this can look like. Again, we have two separate locations for two, um, oops, two uh, playgrounds. Um, so we've got a question number two. Um, this is the high school um, expanded classroom spaces for STEAM, uh, vocational ag and automotive industrial tech and um, student fitness center. And this also would be providing some additional funding for um, a new commercial kitchen unit in the tax lab and a new uh, collaborative flexible seating for the um, media center. One thing to note also on this project is that it includes some additional parking um, directly south of the existing parking lot because during times of um, activities it, it does get a little congested around here and it also provides a provide the second route out um, of the parking lot for to help ease con some congestion off that main entrance. Um, also included in, uh, in this was a budget to refurbish the existing tennis courts with some new fencing, new uh, tennis equipment, and um, uh, the floor finish there. Uh, the new additions, the fitness center is off to the southeast side of the building. The Boeg is off the existing Boeg space. Um, left side of the building and steam addition is off to the north. Now question number three uh, revolves around the um, uh, sports um, complexes that we, we would be providing uh, the, this question. So there's a baseball and softball complex um, on land to the west of the existing school site and a uh, new track and field complex around the existing football field. As you can see here, the, the track and field um, provides an all-surface track as well as all the um, field events uh, that are, some of those are not currently provided there. Um, it also moves the two baseball fields to the west as well as adding an additional two softball fields on there to the west and a uh, new parking, uh, parking lot that's accessed off of the road directly to the west of that land. Uh, the existing two baseball fields will be turned into three practice fields for outdoor sports and outdoor activities during school as well uh, during PE. With that, I think Dale's going to come up and talk a little bit about uh, the tax impact. So as the board went through the process of, of um, making a determination of the, the input from staff on the facility, um, we, we looked at the cost of the facility and, and with that breakdown into three questions, as Michelle talked about earlier, we separated the three distinct units. And if you look at the printed language on the left hand side of that, of that top portion of the slide, uh, step question number one, the elementary, and the, the cost for that to bond would be just over 37 million. For question two, which is the high school academic area, that would be 4.87 million, and for the athletic programs, would be 5.5 million. So as we, we project the tax liability on those three questions, we have four different categories. In those sheet areas, the upper left one is the tax impact on residential homesteads. Uh, top right is the tax impact on commercial properties. Uh, the lower left sheet area is tax on ag homestead, and the lower right is tax impact on egg on the homestead and as we go through this it's for those same questions and those bonding lots so based upon um, if you go up to the top left um, shaded area that's for a one hundred thousand dollar home and for that bond amount of 37 million the annual tax impact projected for that is a hundred and thirty four dollars annually and that uh, rates out to eleven dollars and seventy eight cents per month. For the high school academic portion, it's $18 annually, or about 50 cents per month. And for the athletic programs with a $100,000 home, it's $20 annually and $1.67 per month. So as we go to that right top sheet of area, that's the tax impact on commercial property. And for illustration purposes, we use a $100,000 valuation again. 
and for the element proportion question one is 281 annually and 2342 uh, per month. For question two, the academic portion is 37 dollars annually and 308 per month. And for question three, the athletic programs is 41 dollars annually and 342 per month. Uh, then the shaded area lower left. Uh, now we're looking at uh, tax impact ag homestead. For this slide, or these two slides, we used a, a valuation of $6,000 per acre for the property. We have a couple other slides that, that show um, different valuations, but for this purpose, uh, we used uh, $6,000 per acre. So with an elementary portion at, at $37 uh, million, that's $225 per acre annually, or uh, less than 20 cents per month. High school academic, it's 30 cents per acre annually, and for the athletic programs, it's 33 cents per month, or and, excuse me, 33 cents annually per acre for a $6,000 valuation. <coughs> and then the lower rate, tax impact at Homestead, uh, these, these figures are about twice the amounts of what they are for the at Homestead. So on the elementary portion, it's 449 per acre annually. And for the high school academic portion, it's 59 cents uh, annually per acre. And for the question number three, it's uh, 66 cents per acre annually. The next slide, we, we use um, additional valuations. And rather than breaking this up by question, we go with questions one, two, and three combined. So with a $75,000 home, it's um, $108 annually for the three questions, or nine dollars per month. The $100,000 dollar loan, which you saw in the previous slide, it's $172 uh, for the three questions combined, and $14 per month. Uh, if you jump to $200,000, it's $433 uh, annually and $36 per month. And then if it's a, a $500,000 property uh, residential, it's uh, $1,197. And then the next slide, we jump again, we're going to succession here, it's commercial and industrial property. And we saw the $100,000 amount on the, on the previous slides. But again, for the three questions combined, it's $359, so it's $30 per month. If you go to $500,000, um, it's $2,215, or 185 per month. Uh, if you jump to uh, $2.5 million, um, uh, commercial industrial property, it's 11, just short of $12,000 annually, or just short of $1,000 per month. And uh, $5 million commercial property, it's just short of $24,000 annually, and just short of $2,000 uh, per month. And with egg homestead, these are combined uh, for homestead and non-homestead, and all the valuations are for $5,000, $6,000, $7,000 per acre. And again, these are combined questions one through, one through three. So if the valuation of the property is $5,000 an acre, the cost for homestead property uh, classification is $239 per month, or it's $239 annually per acre, and for the non homestead, it's $4.78 per acre annually. At $6,000 for the three questions, it's $287. Uh, uh, per acre annually, and for non homestead, $575. And if the valuation is $7,000 per acre, it goes to $335 uh, per acre on homestead, and $671 per acre on non homestead. So the next slides deal with ad credit and um, Sarah Strunk will go through those slides for you. All right. Um, so property taxes came for our schools with a dis disproportionate share of education funding on our farmers. It's always been that way. Um, it's especially in large districts like ours, where our, our tax base is very large um, in agriculture. Um, so in 2006, a bipartisan bill was introduced to alleviate some of this um, tax pressure. Um, this credit was basically created to provide tax relief to the farmers while providing rural schools with um, what they need, the critical resource to fund their aging buildings. So just to point something out here before we go further, the number you're gonna see in the brochures that you have, we didn't, does this work up here? It's not gonna work. The 46, why isn't it working? It was working before. Um, the 46 million on top, that's the only number that is in your brochure. And what that is, is actually question one, only after 20 years. So it was something we realized after the fact that only question one with interest at 20 years got into the brochure. So I'm gonna back up and talk about this. So typically, um, our 
Eggland taxpayers would pay 73%, the 34 million, they would pay 73% of our tax. With the egg to tax credit, no, I'm clicking. Um, the egg to tax credit, that changes that percentage from 73.4% to 22.5%. So for us, there's an impact of 51.2% that our bond cost to our district taxpayers is decreased by that amount. And that comes through as a credit on property tax statements. Um, and that amount will be payable, 2022 will be a 60% credit, and 2023 will be a 70% credit from year two, or 2023, until the end of the bond. Um, so the numbers that we're utilizing in the charts, it's not working. Um, the numbers that we're utilizing in the charts of the five, 588 and two, Okay, so for payable 2022, the numbers that we're talking about on here in the $6,000 are 287 and 575. 575. Um, that is for 2022, going from 2023 forward. I broke it, you want this? Um, it'll actually go down to 216 and 431 per acre annually. So the numbers that are in the charts are showing you the first year. They will go down a bit more because the credit increases to 70%. Um, so basically, got done. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out, but the big picture is, is that basically we're able to get our project, which obviously we're looking at $47 million, um, with the tax burden to our, ta our taxpayers um, on that bond project of only $23 million because the state is going to pay the 20, yeah, let's see, can you do this, the 24, the 24 million the state's going to pay. So all that works is people ask me why, why, then why is it a $24 million bond instead of a $47 million bond? Well, how it works is they pay the tax just like we pay the tax. So at, every year they're going to write us a check for their portion that is the credit that the farmers got on their tax return or on their property tax statement. And you will see right now if you do have a property, if you have egg land, you will see a small credit on there for some bonded money that we already have for a project that we did here. And that credit has increased since the start of this credit in 2016, um, and it maxes out at 70%, and it is supposed to be stay 70% going forward. Um, so, and the next slide here is just showing the bond costs with interest for 20 years. So it still comes out to a net effect the same. It's still gonna cover 51.2% um, of the bond, so. And the next <laughs> so what I just tried to explain to you without having a slide um, is on here now. So <laughs> we'll just skip right past that. I didn't know they added that slide. And I was right, 216 and 431. Okay, so um, let's, and Mr. Kobe, come back up here. So the, as Sir explained, uh, the active school credit has a huge impact for the district. Uh, <laughs> That's that burden of uh, our ag community. Uh, before the ag credit, they paid 75% of that building bond referendum. After that ag credit was applied, that drops to about 22%. So now they're paying about the same amount as our residential and commercial property uh, amounts, and the state is paying you know, over 51%. So the, the nice advantage of that, if, if you go back to those uh, pie charts and you can see the, the upper pie, that red portion shows the the egg credit, which shows the egg obligation liability prior to the egg credit, and on the bottom, the red portion shows the, the egg liability after the tax credit, and the light shade of blue area is the state contribution, so um, um, a great advantage for uh, our community. The other things that the advantage for us right now is the, the bond rate um, still at historic lows. The, the graph shown here comes from Baker Tilly, Kelly Smith, and provided that to me a, a couple of months ago. You know, the, the date on it is 81921 is the last date. That's the very far right side. It begins on the far left, it's 819216. So it's a, a span of five years is what this covers. That high point in the middle where it goes above 4.5%, that was in um, August and November of 2018, where that bond rate was so high. So when we look at the, the, the funding project or the bonding for this uh, 
lot more for them than we'd be looking at the, the rates um, shown on this chart. So uh, the, the projection is going out as it's estimated to be into January, February when the bonds are actually sold. So when you look at the difference, uh, there isn't any place within this five year period in which the interest rates were projected to be lower. question and answer a couple of things about the bailouts in particular as I mentioned there's three separate questions you can vote um, accordingly uh, for all three questions um, voting will be conducted by mail-in ballot as we mentioned ballots did go out already if you did not receive your ballot your first step would be um, under where here it says verify your online voter registration address to go online to this address on the Secretary of State website, verify that you are in fact a registered voter. If you are a registered voter and you did not receive your ballot, you would then call the district office. Um, names and addresses uh, are from the state database of registered voters. Um, and then for mail election questions specifically, we do have um, the physical address here if you wish to ask questions that way or email address for Chrissy Oaks if you have additional questions about mail-in ballots. Um, with that, if you have index cards and you have not brought them up yet, go ahead and do that. And as Deb tells us she's ready, we'll move into question and answer. We certainly can if you want it. Okay, what we tried to do, I, I will start with this. We've asked you to write one question per card, and people have done that. We appreciate that very much. That helps us in the sorting process because we will group like questions together to ensure all questions can be addressed. That way when we go through the questions, it's kind of like they follow one topic area. I think it's easier for the um, uh, your resource people to be able to answer those. Now, civility and respect are key to a successful evening of getting questions asked and answers given. And questions should be about the ballot questions and not personal attacks on board members or school staff or community members. So if any of those questions do come up at the table, we will not ask those questions. And so the process that we're going through right now is kind of, like I said, sorting those according to themes so that we can kind of go through these in a systematic way. And we will get started with the caveat that we may have to go back to maybe some of these topics if some other questions come up. We'll start, okay? So we just have some questions on the vote, the voting process itself. Shouldn't expired ballots be returned to the Secretary of State and not the school district? I'll repeat, shouldn't expired ballots be returned to Secretary of State and not the school district? The process that's been shown to us is that uh, ballot that goes out as Mr. Hoagie, your microphone is process has been shared with us is that the, the ballots go out if it's an undeliverable ad address, it comes back to the, the, the school district, it, it comes back here, and then it eventually goes back to the county auditor um, of, of the residence of that uh, uh, address in which the, the ballot was sent to. Okay. 
Thank you. This is a question on how many completed ballots have been returned to the district by the voters as of the mail received through today, 10-13-21. 21. How many completed ballots have been returned to the district by voters as of the mail received through 10-13-21? Estimating is fine. We've, we've received a number of ballots in the office uh, through today. Uh, we don't know how many are completed, however, because they remain in the envelope that's provided with the, the mailing. So uh, we, we have them returned, but we don't know the answer to the completed ballots. I just, just because they have to be accepted or rejected before they're going to be counted. So they're being tracked and they're, when the ballots are received, they're being marked off that they're re that person's ballot has been received, but they will not be accepted or rejected until the election judges meet for the first time, which I don't know exactly what date that is. Thank you. Does the board have any concerns or issues with the mail-in voting process? Does the board have any concerns or issues with the mail-in voting process? Uh, no, the board hasn't expressed any concerns about the mail-in voting process. Obviously, some of the things that I shared tonight might be new information for some of the people sitting at this meeting, such as how to go and check and make sure you're a registered voter, um, which is key to ensuring that you receive a ballot. Um, and then just in addition to that, what I would add is if you um, do learn that you're not a registered voter and you don't have internet access or you're not comfortable using a computer, people do have the option also to come to the district office. They'll receive a voter registration card and a ballot here. Thank you. The next set of questions are under the uh, heading of the need for the new school. Okay. So, first question, how important is it to our schools to have the same quality of learning environment and safety and to be competitive with surrounding school districts with modern facilities? How important is it to our schools to have the same quality of learning environment and safety to be competitive with surrounding school districts with modern facilities? We do have our elementary principal with us tonight, and uh, would you care to address this initially, and, and we'll follow up with you? Yeah, I, I defer to him. <laughs> I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> yeah, that's the It actually helps us attract more students. Um, for instance, when the board agreed to fund our preschool program without any cost to parents, that was a huge draw to the district. And we know that once we get the students in the district, especially when they're young, they will stay with us through 12th grade. So that's a huge advantage. Um, so any programs we can provide like that and have the space for are going to be to the district's advantage. I also think it's important that we have spaces that kids can use for other things, but our STEAM programs have been very successful at both schools, and it's been really important for kids to have those opportunities. So now that they have those opportunities, it's become more popular, and we've actually had to open more spots so we can have more kids involved in those things. Okay, then uh, continuing under the need for the new schools. Can Mr. Burke explain and defend the assessment or recommendation to build a new school versus New South versus renovation? And I think that kind of is probably a, the, the similar question is what is actually wrong with Kensington and Elbow Lake schools? Are they unsafe? So the, the decision to build a new school instead of, instead of making modifications to the existing Kensington School uh, was a decision that the board made with input from a lot of different decision points. The, the, the building itself has some very significant issues. Anybody that's walked through that building and looked at it knows that there are significant issues there. There's a very extensive report that's been pulled together, multiple reports that have been pulled together. Um, we've had a chance to review the report, the recent report that was pulled together. We've had a chance to review UNESCO's report. We've been in the building multiple times and have walked through it. One of the biggest problems with that building is that it doesn't meet the program needs that the district has 
has defined. So if the building is only 38,000 square feet and the district has identified 58,000 square feet of need, that means that there needs to be an addition. There's not space on that site to do an addition. And so that's one of the big deficiencies with the building. It's not just about the building, it's also about the site. The, the site there is 2.5 acres. That's extremely small for an elementary school. The site that's been identified in Hockman is 12 acres and has plenty of space for outdoor activities as well as space for that school uh, to, to have room to, to potentially grow um, and, and space for things like vehicular traffic to, to be separated. Um, be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to do that on 2.5 acres in Kensington. So there, there are a lot of decision points that went into the decision to, to move, um, to propose moving the elementary school to Hoffman, um, and a lot of people were involved in that decision. It's, it wasn't a recommendation that we made. We certainly provided a lot of information to the district, and the district debated that at, at length and came up with the decision to, um, to propose moving the elementary school to Hoffman. So. Okay, kind of continuing in the sort of the need for the, the schools, how much square footage is unused or used insufficiently at South Elementary? You know, considering shower space, wrestling room, etc. So, how much square footage is un unused or used in efficiently at South Elementary? Well, I mean, even when you get down to the lower levels and you look at things like the locker room, which is currently being used as storage, or you look at the wrestling room, which um, some maintenance supplies have been moved back into that space. Maintenance gotten shuffled around in that building multiple times as they played Tetris. Um, and one of the common questions that I've gotten in the five community meetings has been about the space. Um, in particular, at South with 35,000 square feet, sometimes people think of use of that space as they did when they went to school or when their children went to school. And what's evolved since then is things like three and four-year-old preschool, which three-year-olds need a classroom, four-year-olds need a classroom. Sometimes um, those classes are happening simultaneously, so they need their own space. Um, the number of professionals that come into our community today as compared to what that looked like 10 or 15 years ago, whether it's physical therapy, it's speech, it's occupational therapy, has significantly increased. And as those individuals come into a facility like South, where we are limited on space, it can be really difficult to find a private place for those kiddos to be able to work with those professionals. Um, so in specific, I mean, that building, we played Tetris multiple times when we looked at what ideal programming should look like. And even just looking at enrollment this year to put things into perspective, South's enrollment is 73% of North. It's not far from where North is. So this year, um, when we looked at enrollment numbers a couple of weeks ago, South was at 157, North was at 215. When you consider that the North site is 75,000 square feet and South is 35,000 square feet, without additions to that building, what taxpayers are asking us to do is create consistent programming between the two elementary schools with 50% less space, which is impossible to do. Okay, right now this is the next set is going to be a series of questions that are uh, asking about current building conditions. So current building conditions. So this is a question regarding the Kensington site. How much money has been spent on building maintenance in the last eight years, looking at major maintenance like foundations, roofs, windows, security? Question regarding the Kensington site. How much money has been spent on building maintenance in the last eight years, looking at major maintenance like foundations, roofs, windows, security? That can be, a, uh, I'll be honest, they don't have a specific number. Um, memorized as far as what we put into building maintenance but when you look at that site and that many of the systems within that building are operating beyond their useful life that's a testament to the ongoing maintenance that our staff has done um, in addition to that there's some specific projects that we've been able to do uh, a few years ago um, uh, some additional funds came available they changed um, i'm not going to say it correctly safety and deferred um, a safety categorization as far as facilities go for funding to what we call long-term facility maintenance funds. I remember the new term much better than I remember the old one. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we were able to, at North and South, do some um, 
repairs to roofing, we were also able to do some tuck cleaning repairs. Um, we were able to address at South Elementary some significant potholes that were in that parking lot um, and pave over the, um, not pave over, but put down gravel so that there was additional parking at that site. So um, we've done what we are capable of doing with the limited funds that we've had to work with. Okay, this question kind of follows that, what you just said, I believe. Why hasn't the foundation in Kensington been repaired already, as it should have been by now, if it is in such bad shape? Why hasn't the foundation in Kensington been repaired already, as it should have been by now, if it is in such bad shape? I, Dan or Brian, I am not an engineer, and so being able to speak eloquently to exactly the issues that we have at South Elementary and the foundation and the cost that would be improved with that, can either one of you help with that? I'm not a structural engineer either, but the structural uh, engineer that did do uh, a walkthrough here a week ago uh, identified multiple places in that building where uh, where it's not it's not unsafe, but there's significant deterioration with the foundation. There's some moisture issues in the lower levels uh, in the in the area below the stage where the uh, uh, where the, the locker rooms used to be. Uh, that area is, is really not accessible anymore. Um, it's used for storage only. Uh, there's there's water that's infiltrated there. The foundation is deteriorated. The concrete in that foundation is deteriorated. There are some places around the foundation where the block has shifted, um, where block foundations have, have uh, started to uh, be compromised by frost heaving and it have pushed, um, you know, similar if, you, if any of you have block foundations in your home, if you see, you know, that block start to move around a little bit, it's usually because of frost damage. And so um, there, there's those types of issues there and sometimes they can get expensive to repair. Uh, there are a couple of spots in the building that, we, that we've that noted as we've walked around both in previous uh, walkthroughs and with the, uh, with the engineer last week. Uh, where there's the potential where you could have to do some um, shoring of foundations and underpinning and things like that, which can get expensive. And so they identified last week in the report that we saw somewhere between seventy and eighty thousand dollars potential repair that would need to be done. Uh, but nobody's taking it to the to the level of actually hiring a structural engineer and, have, and having them, to my knowledge, anyway, and having them um, design a project to do that repair. Um, it doesn't appear that there's there's anything that's that's um, in you know any kind of immediate danger or anything like that though. Okay. Next question, and this is and this person indicates that it regards all three questions. Why should we trust you with forty seven million dollars when buildings and grounds haven't been kept as expected by the district taxpayer? Why should we trust you with $47 million when buildings and grounds haven't been kept as expected by the dis by district taxpayers? Um, I guess I would welcome a follow-up question to be a little bit more specific in that ask. As I mentioned before, when you have systems that are operating beyond their useful life to the extent that we have within the South Elementary, I, I don't see that as they've been neglected. So. Next question, kind of on that same line. Please explain why or how the tennis court is in its current state. Please explain why or how the tennis court is in its current state. I think this is building bond referendum number four in the 10 years that I can remember. <laughs> so the tennis courts in particular here at the secondary school have been kind of in this flux where um, you know, at one point the board talked about, do you do an elementary school addition there? At another point we talked about, do you put parking there? Um, and most recently what we've talked about is how can we um, resurface those and utilize that space to increase what we do from a physical education standpoint, not just resurfacing the tennis courts, but adding things like pickleball, which has become much more popular today. So as the board looked at what was going on the ballot this time, we addressed specifically what we could do with the tennis courts. Um, that's the, uh, well, if I back up, right now we co-op tennis with Morris. And so our kiddos that are in tennis travel to Morris and practice there. Um, there is potential because that program has significantly grown in the last few years for those kiddos to come back and not, not have a co-op program, I don't know. Um, just depends what the future entails. So 
currently it's in, included in question two because the use of the tennis courts would be for physical education, um, not for uh, the tennis program, but certainly could be used for the tennis program down the road. Okay, this is just a question. Well, I'd like to add more to that. Uh, it's coming into the district uh, just for a couple of years. When you look at um, expenditures of funds within a school district, it's a, a limited amount of revenue, and the district doesn't have a lot of control over what the revenue is. So they can go to borders for border pool. The state provides an, an increase every year. But when, when school boards are making decisions on where to spend the, the dollars, they can only spend a dollar once. So does it go to academic programming? Does it go to staffing? Does it go to facilities and, and maintenance? So, uh, you know, it, it appears to me is that the board historically has made very conscious decisions to, to do programming for students to provide the best academic opportunity. They have a great retention rate with staff, so they're providing um, adequate compensation to, to keep people here. They support the staff members, so those are very critical things for the school district. So prior to what Michelle mentioned just a few minutes ago, long-term facilities and maintenance, districts had to make a decision. Does that dollar go to academic programming or does it go to the facility? Now with the long-term facilities maintenance dollars that are available, those come to the districts based upon age of the facilities, the square footage of the facilities, and then the student enrollment. And what WCA gets now is about $300,000 annually that can be used toward facility maintenance. It, it would be to repair things. It's not to expand or build new. It's replacing pretty much like for like. So with that program, the, the school board has decided to address a parking lot issue here that, that, that needed a significant repair and also bonded for uh, uh, the, the HVAC system here. So after, uh, from 1995, they had a significant investment of $1 million for the HVAC system, system. So they decided to bond for that. So they dedicated those long-term facility maintenance dollars out for a period of another five years. So uh, it, it's not that the, the space has been ignored, it's been choices. Thank you. This is a question that you just mentioned in moment, and there's a question on what is the projection of class enrollment in the years to come? Five, 10, 20 years out. What is the projection of class enrollment in the years to come? Five, 10, 20 years out. So there are, you know, we do the best that we can to identify what projections or what enrollment's going to look like as the future comes so that you can kind of anticipate what your programming needs to look like, what your space is going to be. Um, it is impossible to accurately guess beyond the next three years exactly what enrollment's going to look like because those babies have not been born yet. Um, what we do know over the next three years based on the numbers that we've looked at and the number of babies that have been born within our district is that enrollment is um, scheduled to continue growing over the next three years and then beyond that. Um, the numbers that you see typically on population uh, projections become very conservative. Thank you. There, we have one question that came in was about voting, so we'll just take care of this one at this time. For oversight purposes, can we have volunteers from both vote yes and vote no to, to watch the counting process since the voter won't be able to place their ballots in the tabulating machine? Also, this makes sure all votes are counted in a fair manner. Um, for oversight purposes, can we have volunteers from both vote yes and vote no to watch the counting process since we, the voter will be able to place our ballots in the tabulating machine? Um, since I've been through the training, you can't have people overseeing that process. This is a mail-in. This is no different than a county, any other election. There are five election judges who we appointed last, that last week. They are trained election judges. So their oversight is Secretary of State. That There is no other situation where people would come in and watch that happen. It's just the way it's set up. It's no different than any other election. So. And this is a question that just came and maybe you've already answered. Or Mr. Hogan, did you have a comment? Okay. This is, you may have answered this already, but I'll ask, ask this question. Who counts the ballots? and what safeguards are in place to ensure accurate counting and disregard of incomplete ballots. Who counts the ballots and what safeguards are in place to ensure accurate counting and, dis and disregard or dis or discarding of un oh, incomplete ballots? I'm not, but I will. Um, so 
the, when the ballots are received, they are marked, so we know that every every person that gets a ballot and it comes back in, you're only allowed one, so you're only going to get one. Um, those are going to be, once they're receded in, they will be put away, sealed, and locked for the ballot, I can't even think, the election judge, the ballot, I can't even think about it, ballot board, that's the word I'm looking for, until they're able to come in and accept or reject those ballots. So they do their process, the training that's been done on that, they'll accept or reject the ballot, then there's a procedure, if, if the ballot is rejected for some reason, then there's other procedures they have to follow depending on the timeline of when they receive that ballot. Like now they can still remail that ballot out and say, you need to refill it out, there was something wrong with it. If it gets closer to the date, I don't have the dates off the top of my head um, because I'm not actually the one doing it, but they will actually have to try to contact them. So there are processes for that piece. Once everything has been accepted or rejected, um, at that point, like I said, all that stuff is still locked and sealed. When the ballots are placed in the machine, that will all be done, I believe, the day of the election. I'm thinking about this. Um, but the machine counts all the ballots, and that count is going to have to match. The tape that comes out is going to match your registry, so there is the check and balance because all the ballots go in. The total numbers of yeses and noes are going to add up to the total ballots that are on your spreadsheet. So there is a check and balance. I don't know if that is an, enough. All right, um, we have some questions then on the new school and, and renovation and land in, that would be included. So is the land proposed for the new ball fields on a purchase agreement? Is the land yes, it is. It's a purchase agreement contingent upon a successful passing of question uh, number three. Do we have to purchase land for either the elementary or high school projects? If so, is it figured into the cost? Do we have to purchase land for either the elementary or high school projects? If so, is it figured into the cost? For question number two, there's no additional purchase of land. For question number three, there is, and that, that agreement is included in the cost projection uh, for the elementary site in Hoppen. There's a, uh, an agreement also that's contingent upon successful passing of uh, question number one, and that purchase cost is included in the projection also. Another property question. Why the property location in Hoffman? Was there any other property priced out in Hoffman? If so, where and how much? So why the property location in Hoffman? Was there any other property priced out in Hoffman? And if so, where and how much? So one of the things uh, that the board did is we looked at maps of both Kensington and Hoffman and identified potential places where an elementary school could be placed. If I remember right, it was seven and seven, seven locations in Hoffman, seven locations in Kensington that we considered. From there, um, contact was made with landowners to identify their interest in either selling their land for the purposes of putting up the new elementary school um, or their lack of interest in some case. Um, as we went through the process of looking at ideal locations, we identified an ideal location um, on the outskirts, on the, I have to think about my directions for a second, is that the south side of Kensington? Um, that seems like the, the most ideal place to place an elementary school that was going to be located in Kensington. And then we also identified the ideal location in Hoffman. Um, some of the things that led us to the Hoffman site in particular were um, lack of development that needed to, to occur in order to actually put the new facility there. If you drive by the uh, proposed location for South Elementary, it's a fairly flat um, piece of land that we're working with. Um, in other cases, some of the pieces of land that we considered would have needed extensive development. Um, resources allocated to them either because of um, water that existed, whether it's a slew or a pond, um, or uneven land that would have needed to have been flattened in order to put it there. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah. And again, if people need follow-up questions, they have follow-up questions, make sure you write those down and then we'll ask those as we can. The next set of questions has to do with the cost and the tax and the levy and project budget, that kind of general, um, those general topic areas. If we see a 10 to 20% inflation 
over the course of this building project, what will be the parts that get cut out to stay within the building budget? If we see a 10 to 20% inflation over the course of this building project, what will be the parts that get cut to stay within the building project or budget? Initially, if Tony Smith is here, um, would you have any reason to believe that we may see a 10 to 20 percent increase in inflation before the bid occurs? I, guess I, I, I can speak to interest rates. I guess I'll look to these guys for construction costs. Um, as has been mentioned with the slide that was showing, interest rates right now are, are at a historic low. Uh, we have seen rates creep up a little bit in the last weeks, um, but when we estimated those interest rates back at the end of July, early August, uh, we used current rates at that time and then added 50 basis points for a cushion for potentially raising, you know, rising interest rates until the bonds are sold. So from a finance perspective, uh, we believe we have the cushion built into those interest rates to handle the market where where we expect it to be in February when bonds would be issued. Yeah, and the other part of construction, either Dan or Brian, want to address that? So at this time right now, we've um, kind of allowed 200, $265 a square foot, which is on the upper end of the scale to try to compensate for some of these materials and increase costs we've been seeing lately. So. Hopefully they come back down by the time we bid the project, um, and we'll keep working on making sure that we get the best bang for your buck. This question is related to the um, comments that have been made right now. With COVID costs, building and building now is expensive for, for supplies. And we try to read that again. COVID costs, building now is expensive you know, for supplies. Is this the right time to build? Perhaps if you could address the, the bid period and when the supplies would actually be needed. Yeah, so the, the project is, is scheduled, if not with a successful, successful referendum, the project would be scheduled to be in the ground next spring, and it would be built over the course of the next 14 to 16 calendar months. So uh, it would be ready for the fall of 2023, or portions of the buildings would be ready for the fall of 2023. So. Uh, so there, there's some significant time between now and when we would be, for instance, installing bar joists or something like that. Right now, steel is significantly higher than it was four months ago, um, and and it depends on it depends on whether you're talking about residential construction or commercial construction, because right now the markets are very different in those two. Wood frame construction. Um, everybody knew what happened with lumber pricing here over the last six months plus. And uh, what happened was people decided to stop building. And as soon as people decided to stop building in the residential market, the prices started to come back down. And they haven't come all the way back down. Uh, the, the cost uh, you know, per board foot of lumber hasn't come all the way back down yet, but it's come down significantly from the high point. Right now, we feel like we're at the high point for steel. Steel is almost double what it was about four months ago, five months ago. And so uh, it, it seems like the commercial market is starting to follow the same trend that the residential market did, and we're hoping that it's going to continue to move in that direction and things are going to start to relax a little bit. Um, it's not, it, the, the bigger issues are really on the, the time frames that we're seeing for getting materials here, and that, that gets to be really frustrating when you're trying to, to do a project. And so planning things early in advance and making sure that, you, that you're ordering things well in advance of when you're going to need them becomes really critical when it can take up to six months to get bar joists or it can take up to six months to get roof insulation and things like that right now. So there are a lot of challenges that are out there in the building market right now. But uh, but we're, we're facing them head on on multiple projects and, uh, and it's important to have a plan and to make sure that you're well organized and you have, a, um, you, have your, you have the foresight to make sure that you're looking ahead far enough to, um, so that things are here on time when they need to be here. So. Would it be reasonable to say that when the bid is accepted by the district and the contractors are awarded their project that a lot of them will secure their equipment at that time that they know that it's, the 
that they got the bid. So pipe layers, plumbers, things like that, if they know if they know they were awarded the bid and they need 50,000 feet of pipe, they're going to secure that as soon as they can so that they know that price is going to go up for them if it's available for them to do that, which protects them against inflation over the period of the project. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You, the, uh, and then it ties into what I was talking about with making sure that you're ahead of ahead of schedule when you when you are ordering materials. And so getting shop drawings reviewed right away, getting them out so that we can get in the queue for, for things like bar joists um, is critical um, in a project that has a 16-month duration. So. Um, and this is not an uncommon question that's come up at the different community meetings that we've had. One of the things um, that we have discussed at other community meetings is um, what the cost to delay a project is. So when you're kind of in flux, if you risk waiting for prices to slightly decrease, you're still accumulating a three to four percent inflation increase each year that you delay the project. So when you think about a $37 million project and you add on three to four percent of just inflation costs, I, I am confident in as many times as this has come up, um, Zerberg Architects and Gertz Construction's ability to really make sure that we've got a high threshold so that we don't have surprises as we get into the project. The next question is, if the project goes over budget, how will it get paid for? If the project goes over budget, how will it get paid for? Well, the budget is what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's not like home finance. You can't write a check beyond what you have in the account. So as we look at what the voters approve, the amount is very specific on the ballot questions and that at the end of the day is the budget. And the next question is specific to the, the, uh, the Hoffman site for the South Elementary. Will the city of Hoffman pay and put in writing that they will handle any sewer updates on their own? Will the city of Hoffman pay and put in writing that they will handle any sewer updates on their own? So we did um, attend uh, several of, well, not several, sorry, let me back up for a second. When we started talking about location of South Elementary, um, we did attend both um, Kensington City Council meeting and Hoffman City Council meeting. And at both of those meetings, we did discuss um, city infrastructure and what those cities were capable of handling and where there were and was not. Um, things like sewer and water run, for example. So um, with the city of Hoffman and another benefit of the location that we've looked at, sewer and water runs directly up to the proposed site um, at the uh, Hoffman location. Um, and in talking with the gentleman that's in charge of running their sewer and water there and asking him what that system, those systems are capable of handling, his words to me were we could put a Costco here um, and would be perfectly equipped to be able to handle that. So. Uh, how many years to pay for it? Do it? Does it go up over the years? How many years to pay for it? And does it go up over the years? I'll let you handle the question. The, the bond is for 20 years, and the projections that came from Bigger tell me are an, an annual loan on, on what that initial bond rate is. So it's going to be a stable uh, tax rate over the, the course of the bond. This is the next question is a, a longer question. I'll try to read it in a couple of times. Can you guarantee that the benefit of spending $47 million will be greater for our kids who will be paying for the spending in terms of an improved education and superior earning potential than they will be paying in property taxes and levies? So can you guarantee that the benefit of spending $47 million will be greater for our kids who will be paying for the spending? in terms of an improved education and superior earning potential, then they will be paying in property tax and levies. Well, uh, Michelle, can I have the microphone after I walk through a couple of things? To, to have that question as a guarantee, um, it, it, it's kind of a, a question that's difficult to, to answer. Um, when we looked at the, the needs, when I came on board, we were looking at the needs of the school district, we looked initially at facilities. Because as we looked at facilities, there were some significant issues that were going to cost, you know, several hundred thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to address at our two elementary sites. So when, when looking at that, they, they wanted to make sure that prior to investing either in South or in North, that they were going in the right direction. 
Now through that process, they, they moved not only from facilities itself, but they went to academic programming because they wanted to maintain the same level of academic excellence that they experienced over the course of the years. So with, with those things in mind, it got to be not where necessarily where the end project is, but it's what are you pushing to the side? What expenses are you eliminating? And the question asked about guaranteeing when you're spending, what was the dollar amount? 40 million? 47 million was, yeah. 47 million was this. And, and the district, the district isn't spending that much money. Remember, active school credit, half of that investment for um, for uh, the, the project and interest is paid for by the state. So the, the out-of-pocket money for the Western Florida District is, is 30 million. So when you ask about a guarantee that they're going to be better, um, there's a very strong likelihood that our students will, will fare better leaving here because we'll, we'll implement steam rooms and in all three facilities, which we don't have, which are, are very critical to our students now experiencing collaborative work, project-based learning, um, uh, applying knowledge that they had in a, in a, in a real setting. Uh, when we look at improvements in, in lighting and, and air quality and temperature control, all of those things, if they're not suitable for our students, that impacts them. So when we look at, at um, the investment that the board is proposing for uh, new construction at south and new renovation at, at, at north, uh, it's certainly going to improve the climate. It's going to put our teachers in a situation in which they can be more successful, more efficient in the work that they do. So all of those things point to improved academic performance. So what I would just add to that is that when we talk about improved education, what's what's important to a parent that's got a child that's got special education needs versus a parent that's got a child that excels and performs really well in school or a child that's not performing well and needs additional support, their definition of what actually improves education is going to vary from parent to parent, right? So this is where it became really important for us to get input from all of the different people that have um, or our stakeholders in us potentially um, building the new South Elementary, uh, looking at what the North Elementary needed to look like, looking at secondary school programming, and it was very driven by what the needs of our teachers are, by what parents shared with us. Um, but I just wanted to add on that the concept of what improves education is definitely going to vary from family to family. Okay, thank you. Okay, these are some questions about the new building. Does the proposed south building have any option to expand if needed? Does the proposed south building have any option to expand if needed? I, I stepped on the cord and I unplugged it, so I had to make sure that it was running. In both footprints, when you look at north and south, I have south, no, I don't. Now I do. <laughs> um, you'll see these wings for the classrooms. Um, that are very intentionally built that way for the opportunity um, to be able to add on should we need to as a district down the road. So that's the south footprint. And then if I go back and you look at the north footprint again, you see um, where we've got the classroom wings that are coming off with the ability to add on those if we need to. Okay. The next question is why tear down North Elementary cafeteria stage? What are the structures, flaws, or is it to be cleared for parking? Why tear down the North Elementary's cafeteria slash stage moves? What are the structures, flaws, or is it to be cleared for parking? I think with the uh, with the redesign of the building and, and moving the academic spaces on the other side of the building, again, just to provide that commons, kind of central entry space, um, as you come in the building, it makes a lot more sense to have that, that cafeteria down there. Um, it's also, I believe, one of the oldest parts of the building um, over on that end, and it would be very disconnected from the rest of the, the, um, the building as it stands. Currently is right now. 
If our FIAD is over in there, or we have kids out in the green space currently, they can't be on the playground. If they're on the playground, they can't be in the green space. If our kids are on the playground and the staff members watch them in the playground, they can't watch them get on the bus. And, or vice versa, getting off the bus, they can't be watching the playground. By moving that over there, it creates a, a lot of efficiencies for being able to see two playgrounds, the green space, the bus drop off, Teachers not having to spend as much time walking back and forth. There, there's a lot of positives that come with and efficiencies that come with the design that they put together here. Just to add to, to the efficiencies there, when we look at this area, this, this wing here is a kindergarten. These are our, our preschool Head Start classes. So when parents drop off, they have a direct access, it's a controlled access here to get students right into the building. So um, by eliminating that, that gymnasium, uh, lunchroom area, um, it, it just provides an advantage to, to really uh, improve the space academically for our, our lower education learners. Okay. The next question is, can you provide more information about how steam rooms are used at both high school and elementary? Can you provide more information about how steam rooms are used? in both high school and elementary. Okay, the, the acronym for STEAM is Science, um, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and, and Math. And it's not just specific to those classroom and curriculum areas. It's for social studies, language arts, um, any curriculum area. So when, when teachers are in their classroom, they have their 850 square foot space in the elementary, or they have their classroom space in the high school. If there are project-based activities that they want to do, they can move to that space and they can allocate a, a location for their students to work. So they would schedule time in there. That leaves their, their academic room to be set up more as a traditional classroom or to be break to break it out into small to small groups in the room. So so what we had the opportunity to do is is that we create in north and in south one steam room in each building and at, at the high school, the secondary building, we create two. So, so now it provides an opportunity for, for teachers uh, to take students and to provide activities that they don't traditionally have uh, space for in their own classroom. Okay, thank you. Um, you have a, a question that about efficiencies of having, okay, can you talk about the efficiencies of having only seven miles between North, Barrett, South, such as staff efficiency, sorting, sporting events, etc. Can you talk about the efficiencies of ha having only seven miles between North, Barrett, South, such as staff efficiencies, sporting events, etc.? So Michelle already identified one of the, the main efficiencies is transportation of students. We have a lot of students in the, in the Hoffman community that wouldn't need busing. As far as we look at staff, we have staff members that travel between North and South right now because they, we don't have a full-time position in either school for them. So we have individuals traveling um, every day of the week or sometimes three, day, three days a week between those two communities. And what we would do with, with Hoffman, we shorten that, that distance and, and granted it's, it's six to seven miles difference, so it, it's not a, a significant push, but it saves some time every day. We have our, our head maintenance person, uh, Chad, who is responsible for three buildings. He ends up in some days being at all three sites. So the efficiency is that he's a little bit closer by having his main office here in Barrett and going to Hoffman. The other advantage that we have is that as we upgrade facilities at North and at South, his need to travel because the, the systems that are installed can be um, monitored through computer. He spends less time on the road going to those places. So, but when we look at staffing efficiencies and, and transportation, um, those are the, the, the big things that we save time in and, and consequently save money. We, what I would also add to that, when you've got um, schools that are seven miles apart, as enrollment continues to fluctuate, if we were to, um, you know, and as I talked about scaling back, the floor plan that you're looking at for South here, 
um, and also the conservative floor plan for North, there's not an abundance of additional classrooms. Uh, the South footprint, for example, has what we call one flex classroom. So as we need to break into more sections, depending on what enrollment is per grade, that flexible classroom becomes one classroom that's accessible to us to move students to. When we have a significant increase in enrollment in a particular grade, with having the schools seven, seven, seven miles apart from each other, if a parent wished to consider it, um, and they were located between Hoffman and Barrett, and we had significant growing enrollment for self, they could consider North Elementary as an option for their child. If they were between Elbow Lake and Barrett, and Elbow Lake was experiencing significant increases in enrollment, parents could consider South Elementary for their child. So um, certainly would be an option for parents. Um, I myself was in a grade in elementary school where we had some of that fluctuation that happened and a student that was in fifth grade with us in sixth grade transitioned over to North Elementary because of the size of our class. Um, so it does happen, but that's one of the efficiencies that we have or a safety net with being as conservative as we were with the square footage build and being able to share occupancy between the buildings. I think this is a follow-up question on talking about the, um, the building at North. What structural flaws of the cafeteria wing and rooms that require them to be torn down instead of being used for other purposes? So what structural flaws of the cafeteria wing and rooms that require them to be torn down instead of being used for other purposes? I don't think anybody's identified any structural flaws there. It's more of a, it's more of a, uh, uh, a functional relationship of spaces and what makes the most sense for the, the buildings to uh, to function uh, with the program needs that have been identified by the district. So, I, and I think uh, you know the, the explanation of, of moving people through the building is a really good one. Um, it, that that location for the for the commons basically divides the, the site into two into two portions. And so moving the commons over so it's closer to the academic portion of the school, which is a more typical location for a commons than having it on the opposite side of the school, just made sense in this in this situation. That's part of the oldest portion of the building. And as the, the district is trying to improve facilities, that part was identified um, as, a, as a part that would be taken away um, in, in order to preserve the most uh, reusable portions of the building. Okay, this is a, a question. Um, why were we told that keeping Kensington open would cost too much when Su Superintendent Hoagie came up with a $4.6 million projection to revitalize Kensington that is in line with projections from the engineer certified report given to the city of Kensington, while UNESCO says $8 million? Why were we told that keeping Kensington open would cost too much when Superintendent Hoagie came up with $4.6 million projection to revitalize Kensington that is in line with projections from the engineer certified report given to the city of Kensington, while UNESCO says $8 million. So one of the things that I, I began looking at when I, I came to WCA is I, I, I studied UNESCO's reports and, and it seemed like the cost projections that they had were, were higher than they, they should be, at least with, with my experience that I had prior and I did confer with uh, Brian Berg at the time in 20 Wolf and I asked about construction costs. And so with that $4.6 million amount, at that time in 2019, we're looking at a construction cost for renovation of $130 a square foot. So if you multiply $130 per square foot times the 35,000 square feet of the elementary building, that's the $4.6 million. And that's the renovation cost only for that construction part. It doesn't include anything for furniture and fixtures. It doesn't include any fees for engineering and architecture. It doesn't include any additional fees that go on top of that. So, so with that figure, it showed a renovation of 35,000 square feet only. Michelle and, and Tony and Brian have talked about the 58,000 square foot new elementary. So we've got a difference of about 20,000 square feet. So it's not just 4.6 million, it's 4.6 million plus those fees that I had mentioned, plus the addition of 20,000 square feet and new construction costs projected at 
$265 a square foot. So to pull something from 2019 and pull one figure out without looking at the other costs that involved there is, is short-sighted. That $4.6 million was for renovation of south only and only the construction cost portion. It didn't include all the other expenses that go along with it. Thank you. Is the board aware of an assessment by the city of Kensington on the south building? If so, does this assessment meet the needs of the district? Is the board aware of an ass assessment by the city of Kensington on the south building? If so, does this assessment meet the needs of the district? So I am, um, having grown up in Kensington, much more familiar with South Elementary than I will ever be with North Elementary. In fact, I often defer to my counterparts to give me some information that I'm not necessarily um, aware of when we start talking about North Elementary. With South Elementary um, and the assessment that was done by Angan Associates based off of uh, the city of Kensington's direction to them, when I started to look through that um, as compared to um, the information that we've looked at before, there, there appear to be several missing key elements. Um, and without going too much in depth uh, about a report that's not a school report, it's a city of Kensington report, some of those things that are missing specifically are um, asbestos abatement, which would need to occur in order to put in a new heating system. Um, the piping that runs underneath this school has asbestos. Uh, asbestos. Um, when you go into the boiler rooms, you see asbestos has been sealed. It's not, um, it's not exposed, but it's something that would definitely need to be um, addressed. And that was an example of a cost when I looked at that report that was missing. Um, some things that you need for it to um, be compliant when you bring it up to code are things like occupancy sensors for lighting. So while there was a number that was allocated in that report for updating um, lighting, some of the things to be code compliant as you address that facility were not included in there. Um, and just uh, some additional things. That building, when you look at, and I'm trying to recall from memory, um, when I looked at the expenditures for um, utilities for north and south, north is 75,000 square feet, um, south is 35,000 square feet, but there's almost a 50 cent difference in the cost per square foot to pay for utilities there. So things like heating efficiency doesn't exist. Um, and when you look at the $4.6 million um, price tag that came with that report, there weren't things in there um, built in to address heating efficiency, like uh, putting in insulation into walls. So, um, you know, I, I can tell you that myself, uh, I, I looked at the report exhaustively, but um, $4.6 million is definitely not going to make it um, the building that you need, um, especially considering you're sitting on two and a half acres and putting an addition there would be very difficult. Shelly identified a lot of the things that didn't appear in that report. Uh, one of the significant pieces that, that was brought to my attention was uh, the plumbing wasn't addressed. So the plumbing in the building more likely is, is the, the plumbing that was there at the time of construction. So to go through do all the other work and not replace the, the plumbing would be short-sighted. The other thing that wasn't taken into consideration, or at least not noted about the cost for the report, is that putting in a new HVAC system for heating and ventilation and air conditioning, you need additional ductwork that doesn't exist. You need space for that, that system within the building, which doesn't exist because it's 35,000 square feet and it's short already. So when you look at that cost that, that they have projected at a high end of, of 4.6 million, again, like Mich Michelle said, that figure is gonna be quite short. And if you look just at the standard for renovation and, and apply the figure of $155 per square foot for renovation, it falls short of that. So, you know, based upon that, that very basic formula, about six million is the low end for doing that. And again, that's just to renovate the building itself. And that doesn't take into account the, 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 the cost for um, engineering that go along with that and the expansion of space of another 20,000 square feet. And I just want to be clear. I don't. I don't believe that the number was put out there to mislead anyone. I think, um, and I attended the tour for three out of the four individuals uh, that were a part in, in, in pulling this information together and generating this report. Um, and the discussion that happened amongst them was in related to 
what and how could this building be repurposed down the road? So when you don't have a clear vision, when you're not talking about it being an assisted living facility someday or um, it being an apartment complex someday, you've got basic costs that get built in to address the things that you see right in front of you, but beyond that, you need to have a vision and there's costs that are associated with that. So my understanding from speaking with three of the four gentlemen is that this wasn't um, a report specifically about the educational adequacy of this building, but more so overview and looking at the facility as how it could be potentially repurposed someday. Thank you. Are there reports detailing how long it's been known about the condition of the foundation of the Kensington building? Are there reports detailing how long it's been known about the condition of the foundation of the Kensington building? I don't know specifically, but, but in UNESCO's report, which was finalized, and they had different reports that ran from April through, I believe it was August in 2018, they had addressed the inefficiencies of the foundation at that time. And um, at the South facility, they looked at, I think it was at 17 different components, which the structural portion would have been one of those. And the majority of the, the portions of the Kensington site were beyond their anticipated um, uh, life expectancy. So that would be the time that I would expect was the first that I know about. And when we talk about foundation, so as I mentioned before, we address some tough pointing issues that were at South Elementary. The building's not falling down, um, but it's had some issues that we've had to address as a board as we've gone through. Okay, there are a couple of, uh, a quite a series of questions that combine, that contain data that we cannot verify. It says that uh, a report with documents. So we would ask that if someone would like to come up and write down what those documents are, or they could submit these questions with the, what documents they're pertaining to. So, and you will tell us where we can submit questions, right, Michelle? Yes, so if you have a question that did not get answered tonight, or you leave tonight's meeting, and you have a question that pops into your mind, up until um, the day at 8 p.m. on November 2nd, when ballots are, are capable of being received here at the secondary school, you can submit any questions related to the three ballot questions at questions at isd2342.org. If you don't remember that, we report our school board meetings, and I do disclose that at the beginning of every single meeting that we have. Okay, these are some plans for the, the south building. It has to do, if the bond passes, what will be done with the current south building? If the bond passes, what will be done with the current south building? So that's a, that's a question that did come up as a result of conversations that were had before we made our final decision. Concern was expressed about if uh, South Elementary is no longer going to be used at the Kensington location, um, not wanting to have a similar situation as, for example, our neighbor Cyrus, um, where that facility just kind of sat vacant, it was stripped of copper, uh, all of the copper that was in the building, and then it kind of became this eyesore within the community. So we did build in um, demolition costs to make sure that we address that. Um, one of the follow-up questions that's come at the other community meetings has been what happens with the, um, uh, the playground that was um, put up recently within the last couple of years as a result of um, several community members that have invested and um, helped with that project. That playground would stay intact. Um, and as it stands right now with the demolishment of that building, if question one successfully passes, it would create some additional green space where the building currently sits. What will be the future for the district in the event that the first question does not pass? What will be the future for the district in the event that the first question does not pass? Um, I've had a similar question at other community meetings, and I can tell you I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, the board ultimately will have to have some difficult decisions if, if this doesn't pass. We're running into situations right now, and I'll use our boilers for example, where um, parts either are becoming uh, more and more scarce, difficult to find on back order, and we're having to wait extensively for them. Um, and uh, you know, we appreciate very much that the maintenance team has been able to keep those boilers up and running. Um, but as time goes by, we become increasingly concerned that we're going to we're going to hit a significant problem, um, whether it's north or south, with the, the boilers that we currently have that can be difficult to operate. So um, 
I, I don't have a good answer as far as what happens next. That's a board discussion. Um, as we move into December, depending on what the results of the election are, then the board's got some discussing to do. This is another future question. Can you guarantee the district taxpayer that you will not close the new school in Hoffman in 20 years if the district looks at building a new high school? We spent money on the Hoffman School just before it was closed in 1993, so it has happened before. I repeat, can you guarantee the district taxpayer that you will not close the new school in Hoffman in 20 years if the district looks at building a new high school? We spent money on the Hoffman School just before it was closed in 1993, so it has happened before. I don't have any indication that if taxpayers are going to invest in a brand new facility that's located in Hoffman, that within the near future that that would become a, a building that's not used. There are two questions. One, um, they had to do, well, this, I'll read this first. If, if I'm on the fence voter, if I'm an on the fence voter, what would the board members say are the key reasons this is the best plan for WCA? That's, yeah, so as far as the information that the board puts out, it's our responsibility to put out factual information, but I or anyone else standing up here cannot tell you to vote yes, we can't tell you to vote no, we can't tell you to abstain from voting. What do you think is the motivation of the vote no group? Is it to portray that the existing building is good enough for students in our district? What do you think is the motivation of the vote no group? Is it to portray that the existing building is good enough for students in, in our district? Um, so Deb, I'm gonna circle us back just a little bit and say that the point of the discussion tonight was to focus on questions one, two, and three on the ballot, so I won't be answering that. I think that is, those are the questions that have been presented tonight. All right, thank you very much for coming. Um, and hearing the information and asking great questions, and I hope you have a great rest of your evening.